Good morning, church. Happy Resurrection Day. Let's stand together. Christ the Lord is risen today. Let's sing together now. Christ the Lord is risen today.
see here today. If you'd like to be seated for just a moment, we'd like to do a song now with the choir that we've been working on for a few weeks. Found some great resurrection songs this year. And here's a new one for us. Anne is going to sing the solo called This Blood.
trying to hide this precious blood that gave me life. But in three days, he breathed again, and he rose to stand in my Thank you, you may do something. <laughs> I, I, I forgot to get a schedule this morning. I don't have a clue what's going on next. So, uh, you doing okay? You good? Uh, have you, uh, has anybody told you lately he's alive? And he is, for sure. Let's stand. I tell you what, let's shake hands and greet one another as the choir goes down. Make room for the choir.
in my heart today. I would like to finish the congregation portion this morning with a great song, a little bit newer than the one we just did, called Oh Praise the Name. I cast my mind to Calvary, where Jesus fled and died for me. I see his wounds, his hands, his feet, my Savior on that cursed tree. body bound and drenched in tears they laid him down in Joseph's tomb the entrance sealed by heavy stone Messiah
All right, thank you very much. You may be seated. What great singing this morning. Music has been phenomenal. Again, welcome. So glad that you've come to worship with us today to all of our guests. We've met a number of people who come to worship, and we're just delighted that you're here. And if you're sitting here and you're wondering, what's all the fuss about? We need to talk after church. <laughs> because there's nothing on this planet worth getting excited about like the resurrection of Jesus Christ. <laughs> nothing better than that. And you know I'm not a Ranger fan, but even with the Rangers winning the World Series, that's not as great as the Lord Jesus being alive today. We rejoice. Men, if you'll come, we'll get ready for the offering while they're coming. I want to thank all of you who attended this morning at our sunrise service. Uh, it was way too early, but we had a great time at 7 o'clock. About uh, 180 some odd people came out at 7 uh, to spend time together and to sing praises to the Lord outside, and we had a great time, and, uh, and it, was just, it was just such a blessing. Thanks to all the guys who put in the hard work to get everything ready for that. Thanks to Josh and the team that put together the breakfast uh, goodies that you were able to share in, and just, just a great time together today. Let me make a couple of announcements. Men, we are, we are just a week away from Iron Men. Next Friday evening and Saturday out at Willow Park Baptist Church. If you have not been to Ironman, we'd love for you to go. It's a phenomenal day and a half event with just nothing but a bunch of bunch of guys, uh, usually over a thousand guys that are gathered together. We sing, we hear great preaching, we do breakout sessions. It's a great time. And if you have more questions or would like to register, you can do that either online or you can go to the back table, uh, the activity desk out and to the left and register for that this next weekend. We'd love for you to be a part of that. And then ladies, don't forget about the Ladies Conference, Grace and Glory Conference coming up in April. You need to register for that as well. I'm looking at my wife to make sure I say that right. April the, huh? The 20th, April the 20th. So ladies, make sure you register for that, please. Uh, that will be a special time. A reminder, we will not have an evening service today so that you'll have time to be able to spend with your family and enjoy that time together. I want to thank you for your faithfulness and your giving. Let me just give you an update, if I could, just quickly about our building. For those of you that do not know, uh, we are building an $8.7 million building. <laughs> Chokes me. Uh, <laughs> back out in the back of the property back if you look at in the back side here the um, uh, where the sand volleyball court is at there will be a 28,000 square foot building that will be going in they're already marking things off getting ready and and within the next couple of weeks they will be moving a uh, thousand how do you do dirt a thousand yards of dirt I, I don't know do, I don't do that stuff okay 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 that's enough thank you okay <laughs> we don't need a diagram I just needed one word okay thousand yards of Thank you, Terry. A thousand yards of dirt will be moved out, and we'll be putting a, um, uh, uh, anyway, they'll be doing all the work back there. And uh, we were approved this week with the bank for the loan process, the loan part of that, so we'll be progressing with that. But here's the good news. The more we give, the more we contribute, and thank you for so many of you who participated in that so far and continue to give. The more that we raise and the more the money that comes in, the less we'll have to borrow. So thank you. Thank you so much for your faithfulness and your giving, and we're just so excited about You say, why are we building a 28,000? Well, because we had nothing better to do. Because we want to plan for the future of Pleasant View Baptist Church. Next Sunday, our church will be celebrating 78 years of ministry. 78 years next Sunday. And, I mean, and they've been, this church has been blessed through the years uh, with some great, some great people and, some, and God has done some great things. And we want to make sure our church is prepared for the next 20 and 30 and 40 years to come when Tiger and I are gone. And we want to make sure that things are ready to go. All right? You good? You excited? Yeah. Started talking about money. I just killed the spirit, didn't I? Just <laughs> Thank you so much for your giving. Let's pray. Father, we love you. Thanks for loving us. Thank you for our time together today, for the opportunity that we have to gather together and to worship you. And, man, we have reason to sing, reason to celebrate. And I pray you'll bless each and every person who is here. Now, Lord, we come to this portion of the service. As we worship you in song, we worship you in hearing and the preaching of the word of God, and then we worship you in the offering. What a privilege it is for us to be able to give. There are so many people in this world that would not have anything to give. 
And yet here we are, blessed of you. Thank you for that, and thank you again for the faithfulness of your people, the generosity and the obedience. And Lord, I pray we'll continue to use these funds to further the gospel and to make sure that Pleasant View is everything that it needs to be and that we can continue to reach people around the world and at home with the gospel. Bless again today in all that we do in Christ's name we pray. Amen.
well, that wasn't bad. <laughs> wow. That's, that's an old song. Jonathan, where are you at? Did he leave? Jonathan, you know that song? Did you know it before then? Okay. Uh, Josh, he's already left. He's already headed to Dunkin' Donuts. He's like, <laughs> finish the song and he's gone. Hey, glad you are here. And again, happy Resurrection Sunday. What a joy it is to welcome you. Take your Bibles and let's go to Luke chapter number 23, please. And that's the best we've done that in a long time. I mentioned earlier that we are going to, uh, next week we'll be celebrating the church's uh, uh, 78th anniversary. We're not really going to do anything uh, particular about that necessarily, 78 just being another number. Uh, a couple of years from now, Lord willing, if the Lord doesn't come back, we will celebrate in a greater fashion the 80th anniversary. But um, anyway, 78 years, and I, and I want to let you know, uh, obviously we have an incredible past here at the church in 78 years. The church has only had six pastors. And that's a pretty remarkable thing in and of itself. Uh, and uh, anyway, I've been here 16 years, and uh, it, the, the Lord has just been so gracious to Pleasant View throughout the years. Now, I will tell you that times have, have certainly become more difficult the day and age in which we're living today. It's a, it's a very difficult time to, to be alive and to be on this planet and trying to figure things out. And so in conjunction with that, I wanted to let you know that beginning next Sunday morning and for three weeks on Sunday mornings, unless the Lord changes my mind, we will be talking about how to deal with uncertainty in our lives, dealing with the uncertainty of the day. And has anybody noticed we're living in a crazy world? I mean, it's just, I mean, I just read yesterday that tubercul tuberculosis is making a comeback. I, I mean, I, I take my phone out, and, and, and if, if I were, if I did drugs, I'd be doing drugs. By the time I get through, you know, I mean, I, it, it's just brutal what we read. That's why if I read the book, I'm a lot more encouraged. And I found out that if God's people would spend more time in the book than they do on their phone, they'd be a lot happier. Uh, you know, are you, are you a fun person to be around? How many of you would say, I'm really not really pleasant to be around? Anybody want to confess that? Okay, well, Bob, I'm not going to deny that. That's true, yeah. Bob raised his hand. I'll take it, yeah. If, if, if you're just not one of those, get back into the Word more, and you might find yourself be a little happier. Anyway, okay, so next week we're going to talk about dealing with the uncertainties of the, of, of, of the world that we are living in and how we deal with that. And one of the ways that we do that is we talk about the never-ending story of the gospel, the fact that Jesus did die on a cross, but that he was, uh, he was crucified and that he was buried in a tomb. And we'll talk about that this morning and then... Three days later rose from the dead and is alive right now and will be for all eternity and makes a difference in our lives. Now, here's the thing about it and the truth of the matter is this. You cannot, you cannot appreciate, you cannot appreciate the reality of the resurrection. You cannot appreciate, appreciate the reality that he rose from the dead until you make your way to the cross. You have to go by way of of the cross and that's what I want to do this morning Jesus Christ God's only begotten son the father's only begotten son was taken and he was crucified and the Bible declares that after all of the mockings after all the beatings after all the scourgings the hours of ridicule the the mock the mockery of trials that he went through after all of that they take Jesus and two others with him and they take him to Calvary. Look at Luke chapter 23, beginning in verse number 33. It says, And when they were come to the place, which is called Calvary, there they crucified him and the male factors, one on the right hand and the other on the left. And they said, excuse me, then said Jesus, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. And they parted his raiment and cast lots. And if you will... Um, uh, go down to verse number 46. Well, let, let's go to verse 44. And it was about the sixth hour, and there was darkness over all the earth until the ninth hour, and the sun was darkened, and the veil of the temple was rent in the midst. That is, it was ripped in half. And when Jesus had cried with a loud voice, he said, Father, into thy hands I commend my spirit. And having said thus, he gave up the ghost which means that he died. 
that he died. They crucified Jesus Christ. And reading the New Testament, we find it to be, uh, you find it to be that, that the crucifixion takes up a tremendous amount of Scripture in the Bible, in the Gospels. But I would ask you this, why? Why, why is the cross so significant? And the reason for that is very obvious. It's because Jesus came to die. That's why he came. He came to die. I read about one lady who wrote uh, to a panel of experts regarding her pastor. They said, Dear sirs, our preacher said that on Easter that Jesus just swooned on the cross and that later on the disciples nursed him back to health. What do you think? Sincerely bewildered. And this panel wrote back to her and said, Dear bewildered, uh, beat your preacher with a cat of nine tails, that is a leather strap with broken pieces of, of, of pottery and bone, and, and, and beat him with 39 heavy strokes, nail him to a cross, hang him in the sun for six hours, run a spear through his side and literally into his heart, put him in an airless tomb for 36 hours and see what happens. The truth of the matter is that Jesus really did die on the cross. But why? Why suffer the shame? Why would he go through what he went through? You know, one of the hardest things in the world, I told, I told the church at Christmas, it's really difficult sometimes to preach on Christmas when you've been preaching on Christmas for 34 years. It's a really difficult thing for people to listen to sermons about Christmas when they've heard about Christmas all their life and heard sermon after sermon after sermon. It's hard to get creative. And here's the, the truth of the matter. When it comes to Easter and when it comes to the cross, we've grown accustomed to that, and it really doesn't have that same impact on our hearts and our lives like it used to. We've lost that, we've lost that, and I wish that somehow we could grasp and we could get a hold of how how ungodly and how cruel the scourgings and the sacrifice that Jesus made on the cross. And so I'm going to give you, you want me to, fit, you want me to preach quick this morning? Mixed emotions. It's like seeing your mother-in-law go off a cliff in your brand new car. Mixed emotions. <laughs> Not my mother-in-law, their mother-in-law. <laughs> The cross, the cross is a, is a dying place. It, 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 like the Twin Towers in New York City. They'll always be remembered as a dying place. Huh? Daly Plaza in Dallas, Texas will always be a dying place. A federal building in Oklahoma City. It's just a place where, you, you know, people died. Um, the compound in Mount Carmel, Waco, we ain't coming out. That's what it stands for. It's a dying place. The cross is a dying place. Let me give you three reasons. Number one, because God's judgment demanded it. Isn't it, cre isn't it incredible? It's so simple and, and yet so profound. And again, we're so accustomed to it. Sin has to be paid for. It has to be paid for. Uh, we're all sinners. Turn to your neighbor right now and say, you are a sinner. Just tell them that. Go ahead. Where's Mark? Okay. When he gets back, tell him he's a sinner, okay? Now turn to your neighbor and say, you're a bigger sinner than I am. No doubt. Somebody said over here, no doubt. So we're all sinners, right? Let, let's just all take a deep breath and realize we're all in the same boat. We're all guilty. We, we, we can't, and it's almost like we can't do anything right because we do everything wrong. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And because of that, the Bible says in Romans chapter 6 that the wages of our sin is death. It's death. Somebody has to die. The price has to be paid for. And because God's judgment demands that. Zephaniah chapter number 3, the Bible says, The just Lord 
is in the midst thereof. He will not do iniquity. Every morning doth he bring his judgment to light. He faileth not, but the unjust knoweth no shame. Uh, Romans chapter 2. We are sure that judgment, uh, that the judgment of God is according to truth against them which commit such things. Because God is righteous. You need to understand. God is holy. He is pure. He is unright. I mean, he is righteous. He is everything perfect that you and I can imagine. And because of that, he demands that the people who call him God be a righteous people you have to be righteous before God before God's going to hear you and you can't be righteous on your own cannot I've tried I can't do it you can't do it we cannot do that. But God understood that. But he knew that judgment, because he demands judgment, because sin has to be paid for, Jesus died on the cross. Because, uh, because sin had tainted and had poisoned all of mankind. God therefore said, sin brings death and someone has to die. Judgment had been handed down and Jesus took that judgment upon himself. For you and I, as you think about the cross, imagine Jesus hanging on the cross, knowing and understanding that it was, it was your lie that put him there. It was your adultery that put him there. It was your lust that put him there. It was your covetousness that put him there. It was your gossip that put him there. It was your jealousy that put him there. It was your bitterness that put him there. It was your stealing that put him. I'm trying to think of things that cover everybody. It was, it was your sin that put him there. It was my sin that put him. Jesus, who knew no sin, he never done anything wrong. He never done anything wrong. And, and yet God chose to place him on the cross, to put his own father on the cross. Why? Because justice demands that sin has to be paid for. That's why there was a cross. There's a second reason why there's a cross. Not only because God demanded it, but number two, God's mercy required it. I love this. Because God is holy and because God is just, because, because of that, somebody has to pay for sin. God, God, have you ever overlooked something that somebody did wrong? You ever done that? Have you ever just like extended grace? And Now, we live in a world where grace is being abused today in our society. I was listening to a, 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 a reading an article this week about a preacher that, 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 and I use that term loosely when I call this guy a preacher. But anyway, he was a preacher. And, and I read a, a, or listened to a portion of a sermon that he's preaching, and he's actually cussing in his sermon. He's preaching to his people. He's talking about his church running 12,000. I'm like, dude, if your church was running 12,000, it's, it's only because of the grace of God. It has nothing to do with you. Because, I, like, where is holiness in your life? I would never cuss from the pulpit. Actually, I wouldn't cuss anywhere. Come to think of it. I heard about a preacher one time that bought a lawnmower from a little kid. Paid 20 bucks for it. And he kept pulling the lawnmower. He said, son, this lawnmower won't run. He says, sir, you just got to keep pulling that cord. You got to keep pulling it. And he's like, son, I've tried. And so he's pulling on that cord. It won't start. It won't start. And, uh, and, and he said, and the little boy said to him, well, I, sir, you, you actually have to cuss at the lawnmower while you pull the. <laughs> and the preacher's like, I, I don't, I can't, I'm not going to cuss. I can't even remember any cuss words. He said, you keep pulling that rope, they'll come back to you. I call, I've told you before, I called a lady in our church one time. I was l trying to talk to her husband, and I called a lady in our church when I was pastoring at another church, and her little boy answered the phone, and I said, hey, is your, husband, is, is your dad there? And she, he's like, well, he's out playing golf. And I said, well, put your mom on the phone. So she got on the phone, and I'm like, hey, where is, where's Jerry? That's his name. I said, where's Jerry? He's out playing golf. I said, what do you mean he's playing golf? He didn't call me and ask permission. I was just joking. And she said, well, you don't like it? Get your blankety-blank out there and tell him. <laughs> yeah. And I said, excuse me? She said, who is this? <laughs> I said, this is God. No, I didn't. I said, <laughs> I said, this is your pastor speaking. You know what she said? Oh, I thought it was somebody else. You know what I said? Why would that matter? You see, be sure your sin will find you out. Listen, listen. God's mercy required that sin had to be paid for. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, I, read, I quoted a while ago, For he hath made him to be sin for us who knew no sin, 
Why? That we might be made the righteousness of God. Oh, my goodness. But God commendeth his love toward us, and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Everybody look right here at me. Look at me. Phones down, heads up, hearts open. Remember that? Jesus loves you. God loves you with an everlasting love. God, God's love demanded, his judgment demanded, and his mercy required that sin be paid for. Before, before we ever needed Jesus, the price was already paid. Is that a remarkable thing? Can I give you the third reason? You think, man, third one, this is the last one too, which means I'm halfway through the sermon. His love demanded it. His mercy required it. And listen to this. This is number three. Why the cross? Because God would rather die than live without you. Are you getting that? I got to go down here and look at one lady because she was afraid. Sitting up close, I was going to come to her, so I'm going to go to her. Did you hear that? You heard that? Nice to see you, Miss LaFice. She's like, if I get on the second row, you're going to come to me. I said, oh, no, I'm coming to you now wherever you are. <laughs> Isn't it great news that God loves you so much and he'd rather die than live without you? Amen. Can you just grasp that? Listen, I love you, but I'm not dying for you. Now, some of you, I want to kill you sometimes, but I'm not dying. <laughs> God would rather die. Aaron, you get that? Isn't that amazing? Oh, two Aaron's right here, two back to back. God would rather die than live without you. That's an amazing thing. God's love is so vast. So, listen, you got to go to the cross before you get to the tomb. Let's go to Luke 24. Let's get to the tomb. Want to? God would rather die than live without you. God means business. There's no doubt about that. But I'm happy to tell you. I'm pleased to tell you. It gives me great joy to tell you that the story doesn't end there. Luke chapter number 24, now upon the first day of the week, very early in the morning. We talked about that in Sunday school this morning. I mean, in the, uh, out there, whatever the, the graves, I mean, the worship service, that, that service, sunrise. We talked about that very early in the morning, three times in, in three of the gospels, very early in the morning, and one of them, it says, at dawn at dawn, just before the sun comes out. Very early in the morning, it says they came into the sepulcher, bringing the spices which they had prepared and certain others with them. And, and now, again, and I talked about this out there earlier this morning, but when, when you read the book of John, you read, about, you read about Joseph of Arimathea and you read about Nicodemus, these two wealthy, powerful, political, and religious individuals who had taken the body. They had become... They had become uh, SSE, secret service Christians. And they were secret Christians. But at this point, when Jesus died on the cross, they, they became public Christians and said, you know what, we're not hiding any longer. Can we have the body of Jesus so we can bury him properly? And so they give, the, uh, they, they grant them the permission to take the body of Jesus. They take him, and Joseph of Arimathea, he had bought, kind of like, you know, we do, we buy plots. I mean, we don't, but people do, buy plots, you know, in preparation for the inevitable, right? I have the gift of encouragement, y'all. Let me just tell you, you're all going to die someday, okay? It, it, it's, not, it's not whether you're going to die, it's how you die that will make the difference. And Jesus will be the one that makes the difference in how you die. Anyway, so they said, can we take the body? And Joseph of Arimathea, he had bought this, he had purchased this, this, this tomb that nobody had ever been placed in. And they take Jesus and they, they, they anoint his body. They prepare his body with 75 pounds. Everybody say 75 pounds. 75 pounds of spices. I mean, these guys, they're wealthy. They got the money. No problem for them. And they just, they wrap him in linen. They put all these spices. You know what they're worried about, right? They're worried about the smell. They're worried about decomposition, right? They're worried about the, the body decomposing. They don't know who they're dealing with. But at least they've got a, a, a proper motive. Should we have fun with this? Let's do it. Hi, Mark. Come on in. Your wife has something to tell you when you sit down. Yeah, good to see you. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, y'all know who Judas was in the Bible, right? He's our. 
He's not Judas, but he is our treasurer. But anyway, so, uh, and she just told him, you're a sinner. <laughs> Way to go. So 75 pounds, 75 pounds of spices. And they, and they wrap up that body in the linen, and they put all those spices in there. The ladies are not aware of that. They decide, you know what, somebody's got to take care of the body of Jesus. Sabbath is passed, and it's Sunday morning. So they go, and, and it's one of those things where they haven't planned this. They, they, I mean, they planned to do something, but they didn't plan very far ahead because they're like, first of all, how are we going to get in? Who's going to roll the stone out of the way? Plus, you got soldiers that are guarding, right, as far as they know, because it had, it had the Roman seal on it. It had soldiers guarding it so that they couldn't steal the body. I mean, Pilate had done everything that he could to make sure that body stayed in there. <laughs> it's never enough to keep Jesus down. Amen. So they get there, the ladies get there, and lo and behold, the stone has been rolled away. Let's read it and see what happens. And they found the stone rolled away from the sepulcher. They entered in and found not the body of the Lord Jesus. Can I get an amen after that? Amen. They found not the body. No one, you know why? It's not there. And they entered in, they found not the body, and it came to pass as they were much, I love the way the word of God says this sometimes, and they were much perplexed thereabout. <laughs> what does that mean? They are in shock. That's what that means. They are, what in the world is going on? Now, they, have, they do not think that Jesus has risen from the dead. They believe the body's been stolen. That's what they believed. They were perplexed, and behold, God shows up. Two men stood by them in shining garments. God sends a couple angels down with a message, and as they were afraid and bowed down their faces to the earth, and they said unto them, the angels said to the women, why seek ye the living among the dead? He is not here, but is risen. Remember how he spake unto you when he was yet in Galilee, saying, the Son of Man must be delivered into the hands of sinful men and be crucified, and the third day rise again and they remembered his they're like oh yeah let me ask you a question how could you possibly forget that i can tell you how that's what grief does to you when you get overcome with grief you forget the promises that you that you've held on to you forget the what what god says when you're overcome with grief you forget and they are so overwhelmed and overcome with grief that they've forgotten what Jesus promised. The angels come along and say, why, see, why are you looking for him here? Why, he's not here. He's alive. Now, maybe you can help me with this. I mean, th this is an amazing thing. The, the meaning of the empty tomb is found in the reality that God conquered death. I love that. He conquered death and eternal life became a reality and available to all, to any and all who believe. I, listen, I'm not afraid of death. I'm like Woody Allen. I'm not afraid to die. I just don't want to be there when it happens. <laughs> I'm not afraid of death. I, I mean, I'm not excited about dying. You know what I mean? I don't, and I don't know how, I don't want to know how I'm going to die. In fact, I don't want to die. I want the Lord to come back and not have to worry about that. <laughs> Wouldn't that be great? That'd be wonderful. But, but, but listen, listen, we got to face death. We st I stood right here at this pulpit yesterday, with all due respect, Brother Garcia, with, with Brother Garcia's father in a casket right here. We faced death yesterday, but we faced it with confidence. Because John Garcia had placed his faith in Christ. And so we drove to Salado and gathered at the cemetery. And we said, listen, I told him this morning in the early service, I said, or, or, out there. I, t I told him, I said, look, I said, um, I said what did I say? I said, they, they, many times they say, we're taking him to his final resting place. And I just don't agree with that. That's not his final resting place. That's his body. That's that earthly tabernacle that just flat wore out at 93 years of age. But that's not him. He's alive. Yeah. Why? Because Jesus is alive. Yeah. Help me with some characters. Would you please tell me where these came from? Burton, Ernie, the Cookie Monster, and Kermit the Frog. I know some of our visitors are like, that preacher has lost his mind. <laughs> I want you to know that all four of those characters were there when Jesus rose from the... I make No, that's not true. Okay, here we go. One of the, one of the earliest human characters on 
Sesame Street was a man by the name of Mr. Hooper. Anybody remember Mr. Hooper? Look at these people. I never watched Sesame Street. I'm a Christian. But anyway, um, <laughs> that was a joke, okay? His name, his real name was Will Lee. He was on Sesame Street for 13 years, and he died of a heart attack in 1982. The producers were faced with a dilemma. How are we going to explain death to 10 million children who watch the show? And at first, they thought, well, we could come up with a story about Mr. Hooper uh, is retiring to Florida. But they decided to tell the children that he died. But because it's public television, can't tell him the truth. Thank you. They didn't want to mention anything religious or spiritual. So on the day of the show, Big Bird walks out, and he says he's drawing, uh, he, he has a drawing that he's made to give Mr. Hooper. And he says, I can't wait to see Mr. Hooper again. And then they said to him, remember, Big Bird, we told you that Mr. Hooper died. And Big Bird said, oh, yeah, I forgot. Well, I'll give it to him when he gets back. <laughs> One of the staff members put his arm around Big Bird and says, Big Bird, Mr. Hooper isn't coming back. And Big Bird says, why not? Finally, the line was this, Big Bird, when people die, they don't come back. That's a lie. They do. If you're a child of God, you certainly do. But they imply that you just go away. But you don't go away. You go somewhere. Y'all got that? You go somewhere. And you go to one of two places. Purgatory is not one of them. It's either heaven or hell. I heard about a young man that was preaching one time, and he said he got confused. He got so excited because your pointing is always important. He said, there's a heaven to gain and a hell to shun, and when the roll is called up yonder, I'll be there. <laughs> no. There is a heaven, and there is a hell. And every person in this room will be in one of those two places when you die. Sesame Street had it wrong. You do go somewhere. You may not come back here. In fact, you won't come back here, not until Jesus comes back if you're a child of God and he sets up his millennial kingdom from Jerusalem and we reign with him for a thousand years. What a time that's going to be. Amen. Democrats are not going to be in charge then. <laughs> and neither are the Republicans, by the way, just so you know, all right? Jesus will be on the throne. Right where he belongs. So, we, we, I mean, we need to understand this. This empty tomb thing is a real thing. The empty cross is a symbol of our freedom. The empty cross frees us from the penalty of sin. The empty cross frees us from the power of sin. The empty cross, it's a symbol of his suffering. It's a symbol of our hope. The, impl, the empty tomb is a symbol of victory. It is a symbol of our eternal life. And today Jesus offers us some things from heaven as he says to every person in this room, listen, it's not about being a Baptist. It's not about being a Catholic. It's not about being baptized. It's not about being a church member. It's not about your good works because there'll never be enough good works to get you into heaven. It's not God's not gonna wink at you and let you slide in because you're basically a good person. The Bible says very clearly that the only thing that allows us to get into heaven is the death and the burial and the resurrection of Jesus Christ and the price that he paid for us and when we call upon him and say God I can't do anything on my own I cannot get there by myself and I accept the Lord Jesus Christ his payment on the cross that he paid for my sin and I call upon him to save me that's when we get forgiveness of the past that's when we get joy for the present that's when we get hope for the future I'm not worried about I don't care who's in the White House I don't care who's in the Capitol because I know who's on the throne. Amen. Jesus did not survive the grave. He conquered death. Amen. There's a world of difference. It's a never-ending story. You know how I know that? Because his story <laughs> it's a never uh, I'll get there. It's a never-ending story because his story became my story. 
1975 when God saved my soul and forgave me of my ungodliness. In the early 60s, anybody ever heard of the Beatles? <laughs> As they made their way to America, John Lennon said these words. He said, Christianity is on its way out. He said, it's a thing of the past. And then he said this. John Lennon said, we, speaking of the Beatles, we are more famous than Jesus Christ. On December the 8th, 1980, as he walked outside of his home in New York City, John Lennon was shot and killed. And now it's been 44 years almost that he's been gone. And Christianity is still alive and well. Because we serve a risen Savior. Listen, my story can be your story. Our story. If you're here today and you've never given your life to Christ. And listen, this is serious business. We've got too many Christians today. And, and, and by the way, with all due respect, we've got Christians in this room who we won't see you again for a while. And in the past, I've been guilty of saying Merry Christmas at Easter. Because sometimes I say well, we won't see you again until then. But I'm not going to say that this year. But is our Christianity not worth more than that? Isn't Jesus more deserving of our trivial attention that we give him? Of our limited commitment to him? If you're here today and you've never given your life to Christ and accept his payment on the cross, accepted what he did on the cross and his victory over death, listen, listen to me. One of two places. Heaven or hell. If you died right now and you stood before God, everybody looking right at me, if you died right now and you stood before God, no one else around, just you. Just you. Just you. And you're standing there. And God looks at you and says, Bob, Sarah, Joanne, Lewis, why should I let you into heaven what would your answer be because there's only one acceptable answer his name is Jesus and you would simply say because I have put my faith in Jesus Christ trusted him to forgive me of my sin and he is my savior beyond the shadow of a doubt God will look at you and say welcome home my child because if you stand there and say, well, you know, I've been a pretty good person. And I believe it will break the heart of God to look at soul after soul after soul after soul and say, depart from me, you worker of iniquity, for I never knew you. It's a never-ending story. Is it yours? Let me ask you to bow your heads, please. Heads bowed and eyes are closed. The cross is empty today. The tomb is empty. And both of those are empty so that you do not have to die empty. If you're here today on this Easter Sunday, what a great crowd we have. But I can assure you there are people seated in these pews and the truth of the matter is right now I don't know maybe your heart is even racing at this moment maybe you're a little tensed up because the Holy Spirit of God is speaking to you and he's saying to you right now you know that preacher's talking to you you know you need you need to trust what Jesus did the Holy Spirit is calling you and I can assure you as well, at the very same time, 
There's somebody on the other shoulder saying, oh, yeah, not today. No, nah, not today. Wait, it's, that's not for you. Don't worry about that. Who are you going to listen to today? If you're here today and you've never given your life to Christ, in a few moments we're going to have an invitation, and from right where you are, all you have to do is just step out, come down here. We're not going to embarrass you. We want to pray with you. We have men who will be standing here who would love nothing more, and ladies as well, who would love nothing more than to take the Bible and show you how you can know your sins have been forgiven, how you can know that you have, that you have Jesus Christ in your life. Right now, with your heads bowed and your eyes closed, is there anybody here, you just lift your hand up and say, Preacher, I, I'll be honest with you. You're talking to me. Because I'm not sure that if I died today, I'm not sure what I would say to Jesus or to God if he said, why should I let you into heaven? I'm not sure that I'm ready to go. Is there anyone, you just lift your hand up and say, preacher, would you pray for me? I don't want to embarrass you, but I want to pray for you. Just slip your hand up. Let me see it. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Someone else while we wait, slip it up. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Someone else while we wait another moment, slip your hand up. Let me see it. Okay. Thank you, sir, in the back. Thank you. Someone else while we wait, just thank you, sir. Anyone else while we wait just another moment? Anyone else in the balcony? Preacher, me too. If I died right now, I'm really not sure that heaven would be my home. While we wait another moment, anyone else? Now I want to do this. If you just lifted your hand, everyone else, heads bowed. If you lifted your hand or you didn't and you should have, would you look right here at me? Just raise your head up and look. Yes, sir. Right, just like that up here. Just like that. Just right there. Yes, sir. Thank you. Listen. This is not about church membership. This is not about finances. This is not about um, how good or bad you are. This is all about Jesus. And I believe with all my heart, I believe with all my heart that you are here today by divine appointment, that God brought you here so that you could hear this message. And you are right now on the brink of making the most important decision you could ever make in your life. More important than anything you have ever or will ever make. And I would invite you to come in just a few moments and just come down here and take one of the men and say, I need Jesus in my life. Don't worry about what anybody else is thinking. Don't worry about what anybody else is doing. This is business between you and you and you and you, between you and God. Let God have his way. Will you do that? Will you come? Would you come? Give your heart to life. Give your heart to Christ today. Will you come? Let's do this. Let's get it settled. And then Christians, don't make, don't make God ashamed of you by the way you live your life. And you know what I'm talking about. You already know. I've already, you, you, you're already under conviction. Whatever you need, let God have his way. Maybe you need a church home and this is where God's led you. I'm going to ask everyone to stand. Everyone standing. I'm going to pray. And after we pray, Mark's going to begin to sing, and I would invite you to step out from where you are and come and let us show you how to know the Lord before you leave today. Father, bless this invitation, every heart and life. I pray today for these who raise their hands that they'll just step out and say, I want to give my life to Jesus today. Have your will and your way in every heart and life in Christ's name. Heads bowed and eyes are closed while folks are already praying. Let me ask you to come right now. Folks are already here kneeling and others are coming. You come right now as Mark sings. Because he lives I can face tomorrow Because he lives All fear is gone And you pray for God, who God is dealing with. We had a man come and say, I want to get saved today. I want to trust Christ. We've got others that still need to come. I'm not trying to twist your arm. 
but I'm trying to reach your heart. And listen, God loves you and wants to do something in your life. Christians, you know, you know, what, you know what shocks me sometimes in this kind of deal? Is that more Christians are not at the altar praying and saying, God, save somebody. What's happened to us? What's wrong with us? Mark's going to sing another verse. Would you come today? Let God have his way. Would you please? You come right now. Let's go. Because he lives, I can face tomorrow. Because he lives, all fear is gone. Because I Thank you so much for your attention today. What a great crowd. Over almost 600 people here in the sanctuary. You know, here's what we want to do. We're going to do this again next week. <laughs> I'm serious. Can we do this again? Last year we had two services because we were afraid we wouldn't have room for everybody. And so I asked everybody, as many of you as you can, come to the early service. And everybody came to the early service. So the second service we had like 100 people. And I'm like, okay, we're not doing that again. I love, this is great. I love it. It's packed. You have to sit close to somebody, and you're like, we're just spreading COVID everywhere. No, we're kidding. I'm kidding. We're not. We're not. We don't do that. We don't, we, 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 we don't, we don't spread COVID. We spread love. Amen. We hope. Anyway, thank you to our guests. Thanks for coming to worship with us today. I hope you have a great afternoon. Hey, listen, if you're going to go to Iron Man, you're going to sign up for Grace and Glory with the Ladies Conference. Whatever you need to do, do it. Be a part of things. Pleasant View Baptist Church is the greatest church in Arlington, Texas. Amen. It is. Absolutely. And we are having a blast serving Jesus. We get to heaven, it's not going to be different for us. We'll still be serving. Some of you are going to be like, I, I didn't know it's what we're supposed to do. I'm telling you right now, let's love and serve Jesus. Amen? Amen. All right, let's pray. We'll be dismissed this morning. Let's see who needs to pray. Tiger, come on up here, would you please? guy like Tiger, I should call on him, shouldn't I? Let's pray. Lord God, our Heavenly Father, as we come before you, Lord, we're humbled at the thought that Christ took the stripes for us. Lord, we're so grateful that Christ not only died for us, Lord, but that he rose from that grave and was victorious over death. Lord, as we bury our loved ones, as we look to our own futures, we have a confidence in the Lord Jesus Christ. We love you, Lord, and we thank you. We ask you, Lord God, to continue using Pleasant View Baptist Church, reaching this community. It's in Christ and we pray. Amen. Tells me all my days I've been held in your hands From the moment that I wake up Until I lay my head Oh, I will sing of the goodness of God. In all my life, you have been faithful. In all my life, you have been so. I love your voice You will let me through the fire And in darkest night You will close like no other I know you as a father I've known you